This is episode 126 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. Let me tell you about one of my favorite sponsors, and that is Lucky Guy Bakery over at luckyguybakery.com. If really delicious, all natural, handmade brownies sound like something you'd be into, well, this is the place for you. We're coming up on the holiday season, and I know a lot of you guys won't be traveling as much, uh, probably, as you did last year. Well, the brownies and treats over at Lucky Guy Bakery are the perfect gift idea. They come in really well-designed, handmade packaging, and each order has a handwritten note, which is a really nice personal touch that they do there at Lucky Guy Bakery. I could obviously go on and on about the flavors and tastes of the brownies. The new peanut butter bonanza bar is the most amazing peanut butter cookie bar that you will ever have. That is my death to tyrants guarantee. For those of you wondering if they have, you know, something for your vegan or gluten-free friends, of course they do. Such a cool bakery, handmade items, all natural brownies, no preservatives ever, so many good flavors, such great packaging, such cool gift ideas, and they love this show. Let's give them some business. So go over to luckyguybakery.com and enter promo code DTTP at checkout for 20% off your order. It's an excellent product. They're great people. Their customer service is unparalleled. So go give them some support. Let's get to the show. What's up, what's up? What is up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am still your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, yet I am no longer coming to you from Austin, Texas. Not far away from it, though. 30 minutes southeast is a little small Texas town where I now reside, coming to you from Lockhart, Texas, also known as the barbecue capital of Texas. So uh, all of you people out there that have your strong opinions on the world's best barbecue, just know this, it resides here in Lockhart, Texas, as do I. So today, let's get right to it. I wanted to do a show on cultural Marxism. I know that term gets overused quite a bit and has some, uh, there's a lot of conflicting, let's say, opinions maybe, or there's definitely some conflicting definitions on what it actually means. How do I know that? Because the other day I happened to type it into Google and the first definition that Google gives you was absolutely crazy. And so I tweeted it out there and it was one of the most responded to and shared and liked and all of that kind of stuff you get on Twitter, tweets that I've ever had. And so I thought, well, obviously this is something that strikes a nerve with a lot of people, especially the fact that Google is giving us a completely wild and and false definition of what it actually is. So we're going to get into that. I also wanted to talk about critical race theory because that's in the news now. It's, It's something that really should have been in the news quite some time ago. Because once you hear exactly what it is, you're going to go, oh my goodness, yeah, that's that's something I've encountered. And it even came up in the debates the other night between Trump and Biden. Trump is trying to end critical race theory at the federal level. I'm not even sure. I mean, he knows it's bad, but you could tell during the debates he wasn't even uh, well-versed on exactly what it is and what it, where it comes from and why we are, you know, the fallout and the madness that we're dealing with because of the years of critical race theory being preached and pushed upon uh, a lot of innocent young minds that, uh, yeah, they kind of fall for some of this stuff. So we're going to get into cultural Marxism, critical race theory, critical theory in general, and we're going to do it in a way that breaks it down and makes it extremely easy to understand. And so you guys can get well-versed on this stuff. And the man to do this is my guest today. His name is Stephen Kirshner, he wrote a wonderful piece called Cultural Marxism, the Origins of the Present Day Social Justice Movement and Political Correctness. And I will waste your time no longer right here, coming to you for the first time out of Lockhart, Texas. I give to you my guest, Stephen Kirshner. Stephen, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, man, I'm doing well. I'm uh, actually quite busy, 
but I'm interrupting this busy schedule because after reading the piece you wrote on the topic we are talking about today, I knew I had to interview you because that was so well done. Uh, are you up in New York City? So I typically live in New York City, but currently I'm staying with my family. It's about an hour and a half north of the city. My job has been shut down for the last several months, so I've just been staying here with them until hopefully things get back to normal. Yeah, one of these days, hopefully so. Yeah. What are your, I've never interviewed you before, what are your politics? Huh. And what got you, let me ask you both questions. What are your politics and, and what got you into politics? Oh, let's see. So as far as what got me into politics, it was just a number of events in my life. I think 9-11 was one, another was my father getting laid off from IBM. Uh, that actually happened the same year, so that was a rough year for us just trying to understand the world in general, how things operate, why things are the way they are, what causes them and all that. And I've always been a history buff too. So I think that sort of tied into that. And then later from history, I got into politics and then economics, philosophy and other things related. I politically, I started off as sort of like a left leaning, but sort of moderate, like I guess, you know, by, by today's standards, I'd probably be a moderate, but I had a friend who was conservative and he would argue a lot against me and I found he was making a lot of sense. So I started looking at more conservative stuff and I found that I agreed with certain things like, for example, the the issues with corruption and government power, the value of the free market, all that. But I always had issues with the conservatives as far as things like religiosity. I didn't like the drug war. Uh, I've never had an issue with homosexuality, all that. So... I think the issue, the issue for me was that I started looking elsewhere and then I sort of got into libertarianism. And I don't remember, I think my real shift to libertarianism was when I, did you ever watch uh, when Peter Schiff went to Occupy Wall Street? Did you ever see that whole video? I have seen that. Yeah. On YouTube, yeah. I believe. Yeah. That, that was one of my shifts, I think, because I watched it initially not knowing what to expect. And I thought he was going to be more antagonistic, but he ended up being very sympathetic to the protesters, but saying how, Basically, their outrage was misguided. They should be against the Federal Reserve, against lobbyists, against, well, well again, even why do lobbyists have power? What are the laws that government imposes, all that? Right. So I got more into libertarianism in that way. Then, of course, I started reading people like Mises and Rothbard, uh, Hoppe did as well. I like to say today that I'm in pure philosophy. I'm a Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist. Like I consider that the ideal. Uh, I definitely have been influenced a lot by Ayn Rand. I like to say I'm an objectivist on some of the bigger things like epistemology and general approaches to things. But of course, I don't agree on everything. And again, as I just mentioned, some hoppy and influence too, which kind of relates to Rothbard, but people have argued, did that kind of go off in its own direction too? So mm -hmm. I'm generally, I'm generally sort of in those categories, but uh, I try to keep an open mind and see what else there is too. Great. Well, that's, uh, it sounds like we would get along then. Awesome. Yeah, the other day, I tweeted something that, that got, I think, the most reactions of, of anything I've ever uh, put out there on Twitter. And that was, I basically scre took a screenshot of the definition of cultural Marxism that pops up huh. first on Google, yeah. if you type that into Google. And you and I have not discussed this prior to you coming on here or prior to this recording starting. Out of curiosity, do you have any guesses what their Google's first definition of cultural Marxism would be? Uh, something like a debunked anti-Semitic conspiracy theory pushed by the Nazis. That's close. It's <laughs> a far-right and anti-Semitic conspiracy theory which claims Western Marxism as the basis of continuing academic and intellectual efforts to subvert Western culture. And when I one of the responses I got was someone said, Ironically, they're using cultural Marxism to define cultural Marxism. Um, <laughs> but one of the responses I got was someone tweeted to me a piece that you wrote a couple of years ago, and mm. I, I read it, and it was excellent. It was it's very Thank well you. done as far as almost like a layman's explanation, not you being the layman, but for the layman to kind of understand this crazy world of cultural Marxism and critical theory oh, yeah. and all of sure. these weird terms that are thrown in when you discuss sure. this stuff. So I want to ask you then, first, we'll, we'll start with this. What is cultural Marxism aside from what Google might tell us it is? Sure. So again, I'll get into how I think the term has become sort of corrupted and is sort of used to try and discredit it. So 
what, what this is what we call cultural Marxism. It's also called neo Marxism. Was born out of the Frankfurt School. It was in it was founded in Germany in Frankfurt. Of course, it was called the Institute for Social Research, and the idea essentially was to figure out why Marxism didn't take off in the West. This group of intellectuals got together and they wanted to figure that out among themselves. Now, there were different theories for it. And of course, one of the major influences, which I cite in the piece, was Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian communist. He wrote something called the Prison Notebook, where he essentially argued that the reason Marxism didn't take off in the West was because of the concept of cultural hegemony. That is that that the ruling class imposes certain values and upholds them in order to keep the masses from waking up, ach- achieving class consciousness and overthrowing the system and establishing communist utopia. So I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but it was something like family, Christianity, patriotism, sexual restraint, all that. The Frankfurt School guys were criticizing those because they believed that those were the things kept in place to prevent the masses from rising up and overthrowing the system. Now, each thinker sort of explored different areas of these topics. A few of the thinkers, just to give you a few names, are Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, Eric Fromm, and Max Horkheimer. Horkheimer was the one who came up with what became critical theory. Uh, They all sort of attacked it from different angles and tried to figure out different things. For example, Theodore Adorno was really fascinated by popular culture and how the masses were sort of placated via it. I guess he wrote a lot about how jazz was constructed and it was meant to sort of keep people happy, prevent them from rising up. Same thing with movies and other things. Marcuse wrote an essay called Repressive Tolerance, which sort of re-explores the concept of tolerance and says, okay, we can't allow certain intolerant factions to rise in our civilization or else they'll give rise to fascism, which will take control. And then there were, there were, there were other contributions too. I don't remember every single one off the top of my head, but they wanted to explore this very generally and sort of figure out okay, why didn't Marxism take off in the West and how can we how can we sort of undo some of these things in order to get Marxism to take off? And how did these some of these figures from the Frankfurt School, how did they make their way over to the U.S.? So it, this was originally founded in the 1920s and, of course, 1933, Hitler comes to power. Now, a lot of these guys, of course, being Jewish and being Marxists, they weren't going to survive under Hitler's regime. So they fled. I'm, I'm trying to think if they went to Switzerland or somewhere first, and then, of course, the U.S. They a few of them ended up teaching at Columbia. Uh, a few went out to California later on. I know after the war, a few of the guys went back and sort of set up the school again. So the Frankfurt School, you could even say that it happened in a few phases from the 1920s and 30s. Then there's the after-war period where they went back and re-established it. But what's really influential, I think, are the people who came to the U.S. and taught at Columbia. Uh, including Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse was also called the father of the new left in the United States. He went on to mentor Angela Davis, who many people know was, well, she's still around, but she was a, she was a prominent member of the U.S. Communist Party, even ran as the vice president on her, on, uh, in one of the elections. Of course, she got like 1% of the vote or something. But uh, she said that Marcuse radicalized her and taught her not just how to be a scholar, but also an activist. So, Angela Davis ended up having a student named Kimberly Crenshaw, who, along with Derek Bell, came up with critical race theory and intersectionality. So all of this is connected, ultimately. It's, oh, here are these old thinkers that fled Germany. But no, they had a very real impact, and they still do today, I would argue. Yeah, no doubt. And, and that's the kind of names, some of those names that you just threw out there, and some of what their impact on everything has been, I definitely want to hit upon. Something that's interesting that I think we see a lot now specifically from Herbert Marcuse, is the, I guess you could call it intolerance for intolerance. Yeah. Because now that's used as an excuse to start riots, to yeah. assault people. It's the whole punch a Nazi uh, thing that yep. we had seen since 2016, uh, really. And, and then, of course, the definition of who's a quote-unquote Nazi you know, the goalposts keep moving and moving until it's someone just to the right of Bernie Sanders. And then it's still yeah. okay to punch that person or to yeah. silence that person. D- does it seem like a lot of that, the kind of censorship that's being pushed from the left kind of is rooted from Marcuse? Yes. So I, I highly recommend everybody reads the essay, Repressive Tolerance. It's fairly long. It's actually pretty well done, but 
it was sort of inspired by Karl Popper. He wrote something called The Open Society and Its Enemies, and he talked about the paradox of tolerance, basically the idea of if we allow tolerance, all sorts of different factions can rise, but that may be some intolerant ones as well, and how do we deal with it? Now, Marcuse took this idea. Some people would say he bastardized it. It depends on what your views are, but he had a very cynical view where, okay, if, if we allow all these different factions to come to power, fascism will be one of them, and then fascism will gain root, gain more and more power, and once it's here, it's unstoppable. So we have to sort of stamp it out before it can gain root in the first place. And if you read the essay, he makes that argument about how we can't be tolerant of intolerant factions, and also he justifies violence on the grounds if it's if it's basically an oppressed faction fighting back against an oppressor, it's justified, but if it's somebody looking to sort of quash an uprising, no, that's reactionary violence and that's bad. So I don't think all of these people out there have read Marcuse, but I think they've been influenced by that general idea filtered down from academia and the culture to them. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. It's almost it was almost done brilliantly throughout the years. But yeah. what was the original when when this was kind of blossoming? Was there pushback on this stuff? Was it almost considered fringe, or how was it accepted? Well, so with the Frankfurt School, I think that. A lot of these things, and we can, we can talk about postmodernism as well, that's a separate field, but I think a lot of this stuff, when it came up, it just sort of resided in academia because it was seen as too wordy, too academic, the kind of stuff that like the average person on the street is not going to get into. So I think they, they tried to find ways to sort of take these ideas and mainstream them enough that the population could embrace them and put them into activism. And I think in the case of Frankfurt School, the Frankfurt School, you could argue that some of some of the violence, the riots, and things that occurred in the '60s were a result of that. Because again, going by Marcuse, that violence was justified. But then, in the case of postmodernism, again, that can be a separate part of this discussion. I think they took certain tools from the postmodernists, sort of integrated certain aspects, worked in other things, and then that became. That it, it, it's almost like the social justice warriors today. They borrow both from the Frankfurt School and the postmodernists, but it depends on the school of thought and what they're doing. And it's funny because if you watch interviews with Thaddeus Russell, he actually says, no, a lot of the insanity comes from the Frankfurt School, whereas other people would say, no, it's the postmodernists, where I think I would say it's a bit of both, but it depends on the field and the school of thought and all that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some of the smarter people that we would consider... Uh, almost in our world, essentially, and Thaddeus is is a friend of mine, they would say, I believe, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, that some of these, uh, especially the the new social justice movement and stuff, bastardized postmodernism. Is that what you would believe that they would say at this point? Yeah, uh, yes and no. I mean, I, th- I think, and if you ever watch, there's a conversation, Thaddeus Russell with James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, who... Mm-hmm wrote cynical theories, which I, I'm doing another video series with, with my friend. And they, they actually sort of disagree on this a little bit because it seems like Russell was saying, Oh, it's all the Frankfurt school. Pluckrose was saying, no, it's a lot of the postmodernism and James was kind of somewhere in between. And I guess I'm kind of somewhere in between because I do think with the postmodernists, like they asked a lot of questions. There was a challenging of a lot of the status quo, which is valuable. But I do also think there is a certain cynicism and there is this, there's sort of this notion that there's power in everything, power in all these interactions. And I think if you take those ideas to their logical conclusions, that does lead to this type of activism. Again, combined with some of the identity stuff out of the Frankfurt School, though. Was this, you know, you hear about the long march through the institutions and yep. the incremental approach that has been used. It almost seems like, you know, to sound conspiratorial here, that there was a handful of people and they got together and had this meeting about how this is going to work out. Now, I realize that's not quite how it happened, but it's yeah. unfortunately for all of us, it's worked out <laughs> fairly brilliantly for them to, to have a few minds come over to the country and, and plant themselves within certain institutions. And then slowly this stuff filters through, whereas it may be considered fairly fringe at one point. And now to be against it, on the university campus would be considered fringe, in my opinion. How, how did this work over decades like this? Was it just slowly seeping through inst- the college, university, and all of this kind of stuff? 
Yes, I think so. Again, I would highly recommend everyone read Cynical Theories. I can all, we can also link the videos that Silas and I did on them because the authors explain beautifully how each school of thought sort of developed, borrowing both from the postmodernists. They don't focus as much on the Frankfurt School, but of course they're aware of it. And they, they sort of thought how certain people in certain categories took these frameworks and applied them to their own disciplines. Like, for example... There's post-colonial studies, which originally, the roots of it kind of go back to a man from Martinique, France Fanon, but he, he wasn't considered the father. The father of it was Edward Said, who he was from, well, he was born in what was British Palestine, and I'm not sure if it would be Palestine or Israel today, but he, he wanted to sort of explore how do, how did colonized people develop in relation to their colonizers? How did that influence their culture? How did that influence their identity and all that. And they sort of took those power dynamics, the subjectivity of the power struggles, blurring of boundaries, all those ideas and sort of applied it to that. Now, I think what's very interesting with Kimberly Crenshaw is that with intersectionality, she's the founder of that, but she, she likes the postmodern idea as far as deconstructing power structures and all that. But she ultimately argued, and I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but something to the effect of I can't deconstruct being black. This is who I am. The postmodernists are able to deconstruct the idea of race because they're themselves privileged white men. Being black is something I can never get away from. So she basically said, no, I have to use this as an empowering identity while at the same time using the deconstruction of the existing power structures and hierarchies and all that. So that's where you see that sort of, again, they're sort of doing the neo-Marxist idea of identities and class conflict and all that, but at the same time, they're taking some of the postmodern concepts. Hey guys, let's take a minute to talk about one of our sponsors, and that is Lorenzotti Coffee. I love these guys, not just because they were our very first sponsor, but because, like I've said many times, their coffee is so damn good. If you guys like coffee that tastes the way coffee is actually supposed to taste, you know, with natural flavors that come from the region and the roast of the beans rather than from artificial flavorings like some other brands use, well, then you'll love Lorenzotti coffee. If you're a real coffee drinker like myself, you don't want these weird flavors in your coffee like key lime pie or blueberry muffin. You want strong, traditional flavors that actually come from the beans themselves, and that's exactly what you get with Lorenzotti coffee. You can get Lorenzotti's signature Venetian blend. This stuff comes right from Italy, okay? You can do whole beans, medium fine grind, which that one's actually perfect to use in the French press like I prefer. It comes in these really cool, beautifully designed, resealable tins that ship to you hermetically sealed and keep the coffee very, very fresh. Guys, I cannot speak highly enough of Lorenzotti. They're lovers of liberty. They love this show. They support this show. So why not support them by getting yourself some damn good coffee. So go to lorenzotti.coffee. That is L-O-R-E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee. Guess what? We got a promo code and that, as you know, is D-T-T-P for Death to Tyrants podcast. You will get 10% off your order at checkout. Again, that's lorenzotti.coffee. Enter code D-T-T-P at checkout. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's interesting. I Speaking of Thaddeus Russell, the interview I just did with him drops today. And so when, oh, this, cool. when this comes out, it will have been one week ago from today. But he had a theory, and, and it sounds fairly plausible, that there's a coming split within the Democratic Party because mm. of some of these things, because some of these movements are almost made to eat their own without even realizing it, because there's going to be separations you know, once you have so much intersectionality, you just start to crumble. And so there's going to be the Biden, Obama, Clintonite wing, and there's got to be a split when you've got young people like AOC coming up. And, and so there's a split coming. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting uh, way to view this. Let me ask you about, uh, we've mentioned it a few times now, critical theory. And then of course- sure you know, more recently in the news is critical race theory. Can you talk about first what critical theory is? And uh, then we'll get to critical race theory. Sure. So as I touched on briefly, critical theory came out of the Frankfurt School. Max Horkheimer is considered the creator of it. Basically, the idea is to re-examine institutions and see what prejudices, biases, and blind spots are in them. Traditional theory is more to understand how things operate. So what I would say, uh, an example would be something like 
we're taught that there are three branches of government, that people vote representatives to fill those branches, they keep each other in check, all that, et cetera. They, people like this would argue that the system was set up by wealthy white men to preserve their own status and privilege, and that in order to have, I'm trying to remember the term Marcuse used if it was ideal democracy or something like that, but the idea was that, okay, everyone has equal power and say. And the purpose of critical theory is to sort of examine all these things and show where are all these prejudices, biases, and everything, and how do we set it up accordingly? And to set up critical theory, he had three criteria originally. It was, it has to be able to describe the system, it has to have an overarching set of normative values, and then lastly, it has to be actionable. So, you know, you you, criti- you understand the status quo, you criticize, and then, okay, what do we do to, ch- to bring about change? Now, what I should emphasize with the... Frankfurt School, in contrast to the postmodernists, is the Frankfurt School were modernists coming out of the Marxist tradition. So they believed in reason, science, all that. Now, I would argue they perverted a lot of those things, but again, they did genuinely approach from that standpoint, whereas postmodernism was meant to throw a lot of that out. No, we should be skeptical of science, we should be skeptical of truth, we should be skeptical of meta narrative. So, in a way, postmodernism is supposed to sort of turn. Marxism on its head, and people like Thaddeus Russell sort of do that. But then I would argue that, but then I would argue that other people, they sort of took that postmodern approach, but then integrated it with the identity politics and other things. Okay, then let's move then to critical race theory because obviously that's. Now let me ask you something real quick. Did you did you happen sure. to see the presidential debate round one the other night? Oh yeah, it was bad. <laughs> yeah. So, what were your thoughts? on Chris Wallace insinuating that critical race theory is, is uh, basically just sensitivity training. See, the thing is, I don't know him. I don't know what's in his head. So I don't know if he's, if he was doing that to entrap him or if he just doesn't know what it is. Like he just heard, he heard the term somewhere and thought, Oh, it deals with racism and didn't delve further. So it was, it, but it was really funny because when that segment happened, I, I'm in a signal chat with a group of my friends and they all started messaging me like, Steve, you're up now. Yeah. <laughs> like, because they know, like, <laughs> right. I've been posting a lot of us. And I was, I was basically, I was saying, like, if I were in Trump's shoes, what I would have said is something like, like, no, I oppose critical race theory specifically. Yes, we can have racial sensitivity training of some variety. We can teach people how to address biases, prejudices, and sort all of this out. But I'm against critical race theory, and then I would explain why I'm against it. But I, I think he handled that very poorly. That's my issue. Yeah, well, part of my thinking there was someone, and it could be Tucker Carlson, because uh, having watched him quite a bit, Tucker had many segments on critical race theory and how aspects of it are being taught even throughout the military and and federal (laughs) agencies. And then within days after that, Trump signs this thing like, we're done with critical race theory. I'm not sure that he did a lot of research other than seeing the segment on Tucker Carlson. I think he just said, you know, he looked at someone and said, our, our government's teaching that? End it, you know? Yeah. So let's talk about it then. What is critical race theory and, and why, if you were in Trump's shoes, would you have said, I'm specifically against this? All right. So critical race theory was born out of critical legal theory that was started by Derek Bell, who was a, he was the first African-American professor at Harvard who got tenure in the 1970s. And as you can probably tell, critical legal theory, the idea is to examine these issues in the laws as far as blind spots. If they, if they favor certain groups, they let other, they're harsher on other groups, all that. And he, he had a student, Kimberly Crenshaw, who I just mentioned, who helped him come up with critical race theory. Now, obviously, the intention of this was to identify in what way, what, in what ways are racism embedded in things that people may not be aware of. Now, on the surface of it, that's valuable. Like I like what James Lindsay said about it's sort of like an industrial solvent. Like there's that solvent that dump that if you dump on things, it dissolves glue. There's things like Drano that dissolve whatever's in your drain. This has value. The problem is that they put it on everything. And I would ultimately say the problem, if I had to put it in a few sentences with critical race theory and intersectionality is that I think they start on faulty premises. I think that the methodology is really shoddy, and I think the prescriptions are just are just completely wrong. Now, you know, I can elaborate on each one of those points if you'd like. But if someone were to ask me, you know, like that, what's wrong with it in the sentence, that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, let's. Well, I would I would like some elaboration on those points, and and then I've got a follow up after you, uh, you elaborate some. 
Sure. So as far as premises, it, it runs counter to a traditional to science or deductive reasoning where it's more about forming a hypothesis and then does the evidence bear it out? The problem with them, I would argue, and I've said this a lot, is that they sort of start with their conclusion and then work their way back from it. So they start with, this is racist, then it's, okay, here's why. And if they can't find the reasons outright, they sort of get creative in their explanations. So one, one thing that illustrates this well is, let's say you own a store where you're supposed to service customers directly, like you walk up and approach them. A white guy and a black guy both walk in. Who do you approach first? Right. And then they're going to, well, here's, here's the trap they set. You approach yeah. the black guy first and they would, I assume, say, well, see, so you're just doing that so you don't get called a racist. Well, they, they would say you think he's suspicious or up to something or going to steal something and that's uh, showing and you do. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you're trapped. No matter, of course, you approach the white guy first and it's because you think he's got money and the other guy doesn't or something. Yeah. So they set up these traps and again, they're, they start with their conclusion and they make claims that are unfalsifiable. Yes. Like you, you can take, you can, I, I think falsifiability is an important point to harp upon because the idea of not just can something be proven true, but can something be proven false? And with stuff like this, they, they just start with that conclusion. It's true no matter what. And it's sort of like they've made the comparison. It's like with horoscopes or something where it'll say something is good is going to happen in your life soon. And then yes. anything good is just taken as proof. It's the same thing with this. Right. So that premise, I would say, is initially faulty methodology as far as, again, it's unfalsifiability, the fact that you're not supposed to question a lot of this stuff. I, I'd argue it's very religious in nature. One of the one of the things I was saying to my friend earlier is that when you tend to question this stuff, you, you well, if, if you ask people the validity of some of these claims, you, you tend to get three responses or some variation of them. So like for me, I've either gotten like, oh, this is so obvious. Why don't you agree with this? And then it's like, well, okay, if it's so obvious, give me evidence. Or they say, you're not supposed to ask for evidence that's problematic. And then, of course, that gets into why aren't you supposed to ask for evidence? Or third, they just cite things written by other people who already believe this. So, yes, yes. Uh, so it just, it, it becomes, they try, it, it sort of developed in a way that it sort of shields itself from criticisms, but, it, but there definitely are valid criticisms. criticisms. And then as far as prescriptions, I'm definitely more in the class of the liberal tradition of the color blindness, the idea of we all have the same rights, we all deserve equal treatment under the law, that is. But they, of course, want to give different groups preferential treatment, and they say, well, this is to address disparities and all that. But, of course, my issue with this is that they automatically say any disparity is the result of discrimination. Now, if you read, if you've been reading Thomas Sowell for the last several decades, yes. he's done a lot of good work in this area showing, no, there, there's many explanations for disparities and there are even areas where there's a lot of discrimination and groups still do well now i'm not trying to downplay discrimination or say everybody should do well automatically but it does it does raise a lot more questions of okay is every disparity the result of discrimination or are there other things that could be examined and i would argue too getting getting back to criticizing the prescriptions like if we really want to resolve these issues i think we have to approach these honestly and methodologically otherwise it, it, it just becomes this dogmatic ideological thing that it, it does it doesn't really address these issues at their core in my opinion one of the the tricks that's played quite a bit by by people in that world is the mott and bailey fallacy can you oh, yeah. can you talk about what that is because that's to me once you know what that is you see it constantly i actually wrote a piece on that too more recently i could send that to you as well uh so basically what it is, is it's based on, off of the medieval style castle, the Mott and Bailey. The idea is the Bailey is the big area where you usually have farmland, businesses, homes, things like that. The Mott is the tower, which has another uh, ring of walls around it. And the idea was that if invaders came in, they would have to take the Bailey first. And then the defenders could retreat to the Mott and fire down arrows and boiling oil and other things on the people below. And then the idea, of course, was that they would kill off enough attackers or wipe them out completely so they would win the battle that way. Now, the Mott and Bailey fallacy, it's using this as a rhetorical device where they think a picture with the Bailey. The Bailey is the meat of their argument in the more controversial claims. The Mott is the easier to understand, less controversial claims. So, for example, if you criticize feminism, they immediately retreat to, oh, well, don't you want equality for women? That's their Mott, essentially. But then they don't get into things they actually want, like preferential treatment for women, 
uh, distorting statistics as far as the so-called pay gap is concerned, all that. Right. So they retreat to the easiest to understand points, and I, the, well, sorry, the maybe the least controversial, easiest to agree with points, and. I think what happens is people sort of back off at that point when they shouldn't be because, again, if the, the least controversial points most people agree with, it's all the other stuff that comes with it in the daily that has to be taken. And, and I like James Lindsay has a good video on that too, where he says basically seize the mot from them and, and then nuke the Bailey out of existence. <laughs> That's how you win these arguments. <laughs> yeah. And the wonderful example of this, as far as what we're discussing as a country right now, Black Lives Matter. It could not be yeah. more of a perfect example because anyone who starts to research it and you think, well, they're against the nuclear family. I don't think I would agree with that. And yeah. then you say, I'm against BLM. What? You're against you know, black lives? Black yeah. lives don't matter to you? So they've done a very clever job at using yeah. the Mott and Bailey fallacy to, to really kind of pull the wool over the eyes of a lot of people. Yeah, I've also made the point to a few times. I actually wrote it in that piece I mentioned where I said, like, let's say there was some group, like, let's say natives in Brazil who were being persecuted by Bolsonaro or something, and one of the leaders was caught saying, we're trained national socialists, we're trained Nazis on camera. Would anyone stand for that? No. Right, but, right. <laughs> and ex ex just for those listening that didn't get that reference, explain uh, what you mean as far as relating to BLM. So... One of the leaders, what was her last name is Colors. I'm trying to think it's like Patricia Color. Uh, I wish I knew it off the top of my head, but there was an interview a number of years ago where she said, she was said on an interview, she was asked like, what is your strategy? What is your activism? All that. She said, we're trained organizers. We're trained Marxists. Right. So it, it's like, there you go. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and, and now then to be against that puts you into a category where a lot of people will go, well, then you don't think Black Lives Matter. So again, they've done a wonderful job at using this fallacy to uh, to soften the blow, so to speak, of, of a lot of their movement. Where do you see all of these movements we're talking about, just critical race theory, critical theory, even um, cultural Marxism, where do you see it uh, represented today most commonly? Well, of course, universities, but even some popular culture, like, for example, now there's this thing with Hollywood where they're talking about diversity requirements for the Oscars, like you have to have this many minorities, all that. It's, it's kind of funny because even Bill Maher, who I'm not a big fan of generally, he had a good skit sort of making fun of it. Like, all you know, a lot of these requirements have been met already. It's just kind of stupid. But um, to a certain extent, it's shown up in popular culture. I mean, I've always, I've sort of noticed this more as I've delved into this stuff, even ideas that people have, but they may not realize, like when people say the right side of history, that actually yes. is a Marxist idea. Yes. Like people think, oh, people think, oh, I'm just doing the right thing. No, that's a Marxist idea. Even even just the ideas of like, um, I'm trying to think of some other examples off the top of my head, but like, even just like the rich are bad. I mean, that's a common attitude among many, but again, it's like, where does that come from? Yes. And then that gets into, that gets into like, who made their money, how and why. It's like right, but viewing rich people as like a homogenous group. And and in, in general, I mean, I would say the public sort of lacks economic education, but I don't, I don't think that's because of Marxism. I think that's more just bad education system. <laughs> yes. And even lines like, well, this is my truth. Yeah. And that's your truth. Yeah. It seems to me to spring from a lot of this as well. Well, that, that comes a lot out of postmodernism. Yes. The idea of, subjectivity and that knowledge is socially constructed, biopower, all that. So I, w I would say that's more sort of the postmodern thing. But as I was saying in my videos with my friend, this is where these things sort of trip over each other, because if you're taking from the neo-Marxist strains and doing things in a modernist lens, well, you have to believe in objective truth, reason, all that. But then if you're going into postmodernism, you throw those things out. So that's where I think you see these sort of contradictory claims like, you know, there's no such thing as truth, but my beliefs tell it like it is. Cultures are relative, but the West is uniquely evil and oppressive. Right. This technology is bad, but it's great. Technology is destructive, but it's unfair that some people have more of it than others. It's just like, like all these things, when you actually break them down, they don't really make sense. Yeah, indeed. I want to tell you guys about a great sponsor of the Death to Tyrants podcast, and that is our friends over at Zippix Toothpicks. These are flavored toothpicks. They've got several great flavors. Check these out. Cinnamon, clove, mocha, 
and whiskey even. But not only that, each toothpick actually contains nicotine. And I use these toothpicks all of the time. Not only are they a great alternative to that nasty habit you may be trying to stop, and that includes vaping, come on now, but they taste great. They are way more socially acceptable. They are cheaper than any alternative. Hell, I don't even dip or smoke or anything like that, and I still love these Zipix toothpicks. Out of all the alternatives on the market, these are the most cost-effective, and better yet, they are a sponsor of this show. When a small business is out there helping to support one of your favorite Liberty podcasts, like this one, let's thank them by returning the support. Since you are a loyal listener to the Death to Tyrants podcast, you will get 10% off of your order by entering promo code DTTP at checkout when you order over at ZipixToothpicks.com. Once again, go to ZipixToothpicks.com, that's Z-I-P-P-I-X, Toothpicks.com, and type in promo code DTTP for Death to Tyrants podcast at checkout, and you will get 10% off of your order and you will be supporting Zipix and Death to Tyrants at the same time. So go do it. Let's get back to the show. For the person just cruising down the road listening to this podcast, that here's, you know, they might even think some of this talk between uh, you and me is is almost, I don't know, in a weird bubble. And it's like, okay, yeah, these things things are strange, and I get that it sounds weird. Why would it affect me? How would you explain to the layman why some of this stuff is bad and how it could harmfully impact uh, many of us. Well, again, I would sort of rehash what I said about what the issues with critical race theory are as far as premises, methodology, and then the prescriptions. I would sort of walk through that again. And I would also just say that there there was sort of this misconception that a lot of these crazy students would get out into the real world. You, You heard that, I'm sure, like, you know, oh, these college kids think all this, but they'll get out into the real world, they'll grow up, and they'll realize things aren't what they thought. But of course, what happened is a lot of these people came out of colleges. They wanted to enshrine all these ideas in institutions and in law. And now we're fighting back against that. Yes. And I think a lot of people should be very concerned because, for example, they talked about there's criticisms of homeschooling now. Some people are saying, oh, homeschooling is only exists because racists want to, you know, pass along their racism and keep their kids from getting, quote unquote, properly educated. Uh, all the workplace requirements. I think, I don't know if you've read or heard about Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, but one of the ideas that he espouses is that he wants an anti-racist constitutional amendment. Now, Mm -hmm. on the surface of it, okay, that sounds nice, but one of the things it entails is there would be a committee that would investigate agencies or people for racist activities and they'd be punished accordingly. Now, what's really scary with that is who decides what's racist? Well, it would be him and company, and then anyone could be subject to this. So it ultimately becomes totalitarianism. And as I said to my friend earlier, like all totalitarianism, it's sort of this, it's a scary thing of, we want to achieve these ends, we don't care how bad the means are. And that, that really never ends well. That's very scary. Yes, exactly. A guest I had on a few episodes ago, you know, he discussed Hitler's utopian vision wasn't gas chambers and ovens it was what happens after that's all taken care of and Pol Pot and the killing fields that that's not their vision the vision is after you take care of the quote-unquote others and and unfortunately the others you know at some point might be you or me yeah so and and if you read how to be an anti-racist it's like he he says Everything is either racist or anti-racist. There's no middle ground. Well, if you understand basic logic, that's a false dichotomy. And then he he has some really sort of strange pronouncements. Like he says, he said to Ezra Klein from Vox that the capital gains tax cut would be racist. And Klein said, why? He's like, well, because there are fewer black people investing in the stock market. So that money should be taxed and used to help black people. So he's automatically setting it up as either you're with me or against me. And again, you give someone like that power, those, if those were the laws, we'd all be living under that. And then it would be, what, I mean, what, what would be next? Oh, you criticize him, you go to jail, you criticize or question these ideas, you go to jail. That, there, that I don't really see an end in sight for these ideas. It's not, let's lay down a few rules and leave it at that. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very, there's a very religious aspect yeah. to that whole thing. Yeah. And I don't mean that as dogging anyone's specific religion. I mean, the the qualities and and parts of a religion 
that make it up. This is a lot of what we're seeing on the left right now. Oh, yeah. There's a very good video from a number of years ago. Is intersectionality a religion? And it, it was Peter Bogosian, I want to say James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, and they talk about like all the similarities of white privilege is the original sin, how blasphemy, political correctness, of course, unfalsifiability, all these claims that just have to be taken on faith. Uh, they talked about prophets, like, you know, now naming things after George Floyd and all that. Um, Satan, I guess, could be Trump or somebody. Uh, <laughs> pro- prophets, of, prophets, of course, could be these various scholars. And, and on and on. It's, it's a very good video. It's, it's longer, maybe like an hour and a half or something. But it is funny because, like, they walk through it and it's like, you're like, yeah, this really is a religion. <laughs> What's the best way to fight all of this madness in your mind? It's tough. I mean, I think I think that executive order is a start. I'm glad to see people glad to see people wake up to it. I think people just have to be brave and understand what it is and know how to argue against it. I wrote another two pieces about arguing against popular talking points because I a lot of people they hear certain popular talking points and I think they back down because they're scared of being labeled bigots or something. What it, it, what I always say is like I don't know those kinds of people have been calling me a bigot for at least the last five or so years probably more so it's like I don't really care at this point. Yeah. Um, but I think I think people just have to be brave because again the hard left activists but based on a hidden tribes report and other things they only make up eight to ten percent of the population and I don't I don't see why we should let that small percentage dictate things but I think a lot of people just don't know what to believe or don't care so they get sort of bullied into going along with a lot of things like this, unfortunately. Well, Stephen, this has been good, man. I've appreciated this. Where where can my listeners find your work? And of course, I'll link to it all on the show notes page for this episode. Yeah, so I have a page on Medium uh, that I've written my blogs before you found that one. I also have... I, I don't have... I have my own YouTube channel, but I don't really use it. I, my videos are with my friend, though, but we can maybe provide a link to his channel. I've done quite a few with him. And then, of course, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, all that. So, Excellent. Stephen yeah, sure. Kirshner, man, yeah. I'm going to link to all that. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here on Death to Tyrants. Thank you for having me. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Stephen. I like talking to people about this kind of stuff, especially when they can present it to you in such a uh, simplistic yet educational manner. And I think that's what Stephen did. So thank you once again for being here on the show, Stephen. As for this show... You know, we're coming to you from Lockhart, Texas. That means nothing as far as how you can contact me. It's all still the same. DeathToTyrantsPodcast.com. It's got the Facebook link, the Twitter link, the the Patreon link, and what else? Instagram. I'm even on Instagram and it's on there. And about that Patreon link, if you'd like to become a Patreon donor to myself, of this show in the broader sense, You can do that, obviously, and about once a month, we're going to put out an episode specifically, exclusively for my Patreon donors. And after we play my outro music here, we're going to play a little clip from the latest episode of a Patreon exclusive episode of the Death to Tyrants podcast. So to sign up and become a Patreon donor, go to patreon.com slash death to tyrants. And I think that's about, oh, oh yeah. Subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating and review. As you guys probably know, that kind of stuff helps podcasts get out there even more than we already are. And of course, visit my wonderful sponsors. Thank you guys so much, and I will talk to you next week. You get split in fucking half, but I call them the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Dyer. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. There's a lot more, and, and this could be because I have a podcast, so I've got more um, friends and co-workers and stuff like that coming up to me that I wouldn't have thought cared about this kind of stuff. But there's a lot more people probably than we realize that are at least... Uh, open to hearing our side of the argument. And at least as far as the culture war stuff goes, they see the, the you know, because the left has won all of their battles for the most part, 
uh, not only through the courts, but incrementally over the years. And I think a lot of people see the giant leaps and bounds that the left is trying to take right now. And you don't have to be a Trump supporter to necessarily look at it and go, whoa, 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 this is way too much. And, and I think that there's a larger audience than we might have thought a few years ago that's open to our message in, in that light, at least. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because it, liberty is not mutually exclusively a right wing or a left wing thing. It can be applied through the whole spectrum. I mean, not if you're like a full blown like tanky or Nazi or something like that, but you know what I mean? Like you can, like the Scott Horton rule is one way of looking at it, attack the left from the left and the right from the right kind of thing. Um, I don't even like the word attack in that context. It's it's you want to try to relate to these people by speaking their own language and at least on some historical basis, the left has been pro-liberty at some points in history and the right claims so much to be small government and small spending, the constituents do at least. Um, I think that you can get these messages across regardless of someone's, how they identify on the uh, left and right spectrum. 